Well, hello, and welcome to Circus History Live. I'm Bruce Hawley, president of the Circus Historical Society. Circus History Live is presented monthly by the CHS. Recordings of previous programs are available on the Circus Historical Society YouTube channel. Tonight, in celebration of Black History Month, we are very pleased to have our featured guest, uh, Kip Jones, and several other members of the legendary King Charles Troop. And now here's the host of Circus History Live, CHS Vice President, Chris Berry. Chris? Thanks, Bruce, and uh, welcome to another edition of Circus History Live. We've got a great program tonight. Uh, we're going to take a look at the King Charles Troop on the, so the 55th anniversary of the first year that they were with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. But actually, the, the act started a lot longer before that, and we're going to kind of take a look back not only at uh, what happened in the South Bronx, but actually what happened even before that. On November the 17th, 1919, a young man by the name of Jerry King was at the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus in Tampa, Florida, November 17th, 1919. He didn't have enough money to get into the show, but he looked under the tent and he saw somebody riding a unicycle. It was a message that stayed with him after he had his own kids, moved to New York, moved to the South Bronx, moved to a very uh, kind of, underprivileged neighborhood at the time, 1940s, 1950s. And he always thought about that unicycle until finally one day he got one for his son, Charles King. And I wanna first bring in uh, Kip Jones. Kip is the guy who's kind of continuing this legacy that was started back in uh, 1958, really. So Kip, tell us about uh, where we are right now and then we'll take a look back. Sure, sure. So uh, I am... Uh from a second generation of uh, the King Charles Unicycle Troop. Uh, and we are now current date at a fifth uh, generation of King Charles uh, Unicycle uh, riders, continuing uh, the old man's, uh, who we refer to as Jerry King, the old man, um, his legacy on building character uh, and teaching discipline and uh, direction to kids in similar neighborhoods that we grew up in um, on the importance about, you know, reaching back to your community and looking out for one another and, you know, uh, taking his passion and, you know, offering it to the kids in the neighborhood uh, that wanted to learn how to ride. So now we are currently doing some work with Omnium Circus with this fifth generation, and we hope to pass it on to another generation uh, of kids now. So I want to go back now to the, to the early 1960s. Uh, this young kid, his name was uh, Charles King, had learned to ride a, a unicycle, and it was at a place called Cretona Park, one of the big one of the big parks there in the South Bronx, where a young fellow by the name of Bill Minson saw them riding. And I want to bring Bill into the call right now. Bill, what was it like when you were there on that playground and you saw these kids riding unicycles on ba and playing basketball? Well, good evening, everyone. This is a great night on Black History Month. Thank you. Chris, it was uh, very unusual. It's almost like seeing um, uh, aliens come down in the flying saucer. I looked down at this basketball court and I saw these guys playing basketball on unicycles and I'd never seen anything like it. I had been uh, attending a lot of television shows. I was clued into entertainment, but this was, this was spectacular. And it made me want to um, meet the guys. And of course, when I met the guys, then I found out that uh, Jerry King was the, um, the, uh, the gentleman that had brought these kids together as a way to keep them active, doing something positive in the community. And from that meeting, of course, um, I, I asked him, I said, listen, what, what are you trying to do? And he said, well, we want to show that young black kids can make a difference. We want to do show that we can do something positive. And because I was going to so many different shows at the time, I reached out to a show called I've Got a Secret and sent them some photographs. And as a result of that, was able to get them on the, uh, on the show. And as a result of being on the show, we met Trolley Rodin, whose wife was on the show. Trolley's wife did a horse dressage act in Ringling Brothers. And uh, Trolley and I became great friends. And for almost two and a half years, Trolley tried 
and tried to get us in the show. And then at the end of that period, the show was sold to Irvin, Israel, Fell, and Judge Roy Hoffines. And I got that phone call from Trolley. Bill, Mr. Fell wants to see the group. And we hustle a group together, couldn't find anybody. Any other day, everybody would have been available. But that particular day was rough, but we got about five guys down there and, and in front of Madison Square Garden, had the pleasure of meeting Irvin Fell for the first time. Trolley was smiling, I was smiling. The guys did a short routine. Mr. Fell said, thank you. And a couple of days later, I got the call from Trolley. Bill, Mr. Fell wants to group. And history oh. was I want to I want to back up just a little bit uh, on this story too. Uh, there are a couple of things that are important to this. It, Bill, you were only a teenager yourself when you got them into these television programs. Not only I've got a secret, but Mike Douglas and some of the other programs. There was a big break in 1966. Uh, Johnny Carson was on vacation. He had that particular week. He had African American guest hosts the entire week. And on the night that Perry, that Harry Belafonte was hosting, the King Charles Riders, as they were called at the time, were on the show, and Irvin Feld saw it. He wasn't even owning the circus at that point. But a couple of years later, in April of 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. The Madison Square Garden show of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey closed for a couple of days. That was the other thing that happened that April 1968. That photograph that we just showed of uh, that was taken outside, there was no circus going on that day. But Irvin Feld, who actually had provided entertainment without any, without any concern about race or prejudice, knew that this was going to be a great act. And indeed it was, right, Bill? Well, you know, Chris was so interesting about that. Uh, after we we appeared on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson in '66, and I became um, uh, Johnny welcomed me backstage night after night after night. And that night you're talking about that week, Harry Belafonte was hosting. Martin Luther King was a guest on the show, and I happened to be backstage as I would be so many nights before the show would start and see Johnny. But that night, Harry came down the stairs. And down the stairs behind him came Dr. King. And that gave me a chance to meet Dr. King and shake his hand. A couple of months what, later, I was walking past his casket. What uh, what what a story. Um, a, yeah. So so Irvin Feld ends up hiring uh these young fellas. Uh they come down to uh they come down to Venice, Florida, and you were there with them, Bill. And I want to bring in another uh a guest who we have on the line here. I don't know if he's uh, gonna be able to turn on his mic. But there's a fellow on the line by the name of Scott Bryan. And Scott was a part of the first Clown College class in 1969. And Scott, if you can turn on your microphone, tell us what it was like when these young fellows arrived from uh, New York. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, I had just turned 18 and uh, I met all of them and I met Bill and uh, we were just so young and everything was so new we just had so much fun together now you told me a story about uh you know you had grown up in southern california uh you were down in the south for the first time and uh you were hanging out with these guys african-american guys and maybe uh they weren't as accepted by some of the locals as uh, they might be today well i met bill was it about a year ago bill we met at the airport uh, not too much, not too much longer. Yeah, it was great. And I was saying, hey, it was great down south. You know, we never had any trouble. And he goes, well, we had trouble when you weren't with us. <laughs> he had, was it a Cadillac at the time you guys were all riding around in and I was with you? Yeah. You mean when I got arrested? Yeah. Well, I didn't know that until you told me that last year. Yeah. Well, this is breaking news, Chris. <laughs> the rev was locked up. <laughs> yeah, well, well, um, you know, I know it was probably unusual to see a large group of young black men uh, in this area that that maybe, you know, they thought they might be up to no good. But in reality, they were up to a lot of good. This picture here shows a this is a very early picture of the troop. 
uh, on the circus. As you can see, the costumes even still say KC Riders on them. Bill, tell us a little bit about how that name King Charles Troop came about. Well, when I, uh, when I found them in the park and we started doing television shows, uh, and, we, and we started doing Merv Griffin and Mike Douglas and uh, uh, other shows, I thought King Charles Troop had a better ring for entertainment. So we changed from the Charles Unicycle Riders to the King Charles Troop. And of course, that's the word, that's the name renowned around the world now. Uh, if you mention unicycles in the King Charles Troop, everybody knows them like the Harlem Globetrotters. So, so, uh, so and the Harlem Globetrotters, I mean, that's a great and great analysis, you know, or anal analogy uh, with who the performers are. I mean, they do things that you're not expecting, but they do it on a unicycle, uh, sure. which makes it even that much more unusual. Kip, so. So tell me a little bit about uh, you know how the how the troop grew and uh, what has happened really since 1969. We've got a couple of people who were with you uh, over the past few years. We've got uh, not only uh, Daryl Johnson DJ, but we also have Valerie Mung uh, Mung Mungo, who uh, was one of the Queen Charles. That's right. Um, like I had mentioned before, Chris, uh, I grew up as uh, a second generation. Uh, unicyclist and actually me and Val lived in the same apartment building uh, when I was first when I first joined the troop as a uh, as a junior um, and again you know how I stumbled across the troop was one day I was just you know hanging out with a good buddy of mine in school and he mentioned he was going to go try out for some unicycle team so I'm sorry for a, um, a, 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 a sports team so I said all right, all right I'll, I'll tag along with you and then uh, I walked into the gym with uh, 20 some guys doing these athletic, amazing things. I've never seen kids of color do on a one wheel unicycle and fell in love with it ever since. So I wanna, uh, I wanna take us all back to 1969, 55 years. And I'm gonna try to show us a little clip of that very first national television program on highlights of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. They'd seen, been seen on national television before, but this is a clip from 1969. The show was filmed in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and it was shown on the, it was taped and then shown on the night that Ringling opened at Madison Square Garden, the, the Red Unit in 19, um, in 1969. So let's give it us a shot here. So, Bill, this must bring back memories. Chris, I'm looking at this man. I, I tell you, I, I don't even know what to say. It just brings back so many memories. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, of course, being at the Barclay Center the other night with Kenneth Feld and his family watching the new Ringling Show open, all these memories flooded back. Of our now, do you see that Richard clown Marshall. back there? Right behind, what? like, with that orange? That's that's our buddy Scott Bryan, who was... Talking just a few minutes ago, I think you played sort of a referee there, right, Scott? So uh, at this point, you had a group of, uh, of 10 regulars on the show. Uh, yeah. They would typically come out and play uh, five, five players in the rings one and two, and then come into the center ring and uh, do the, the main part of the act. Yes, yes. And if I'm not mistaken, Scott, I think it was shortly during or after the Madison Square Garden run that Irvin Fell decided uh, he wanted a second group for the blue unit that they were putting together. And we started absolutely. working on that. That is absolutely correct. What was happening was in 1970, they were celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Barnum and Bailey Greatest Show on Earth. And uh, he knew that he had a hit with the King Charles group. So he had two units in 1970. Uh, and they continue. And I love that on the ring curb, riding on the ring curb. That's David Wright. That's David Wright, one of the one of the greatest King Charles riders ever. David Wright. Yeah. Boy. Man, that brings back some beautiful memories, man. That yeah, is spectacular. That's terrific. Well, um, so so let's talk a little bit about the Kings themselves. 
uh, obviously, uh, you know, you've got Jerry King, who was such a leader in the community there in the South Bronx. Uh, Kip, DJ, uh, Valerie, you know, I, I know that not all of you knew Jerry King, but boy, that the legacy continues on today, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah indeed. Uh, yes, indeed. Actually, we were all uh, fortunate to come uh, in the presence of the old man, as we affectionately uh, call him, and, you know, learn from a lot of his uh, vision and direction on what plans he had in store for us, uh, you know, moving forward with the uh, the unicycle. But he was also really a community leader in that he he was out to keep kids out of trouble, too, right? Yeah, correct. You know, uh, a, a lot of the things that if kids wanted to learn how to a unis, uh, to do a unicycle, uh, there were certain uh, dog rules and principles that you had to do. You had to, you know, do go, do good in school. You had to, you know, uh, pay attention and and listen to your your mom and dad. You had to help clean up the neighborhood uh, on on certain occasions. And you know, he knew that kids were going to gravitate uh, to this, and he he used that to uh, his advantage to, you know, again, help steer them away from the, a lot of the social evils that were surrounding uh, the kids in the neighborhood at the time. So, Valerie, do you remember when you first heard about the King, King Charles group? Um, absolutely. And I want to just uh, thank you for including me. I wanted to interject. Um, also, in addition to Mr. King was <laughs> Alma King, his wife, and she played a pivotal role in shaping the Queen Charles Troop, teaching young women how to be women, to be respected, and to carry yourself in a manner that the King Charles Troop would be proud of. Um, so I have so many amazing <laughs> memories of the King Charles Troop, uh, Mr. Mr. King, um, Charlie King. So when I saw the picture, a moment ago, I had to remove myself from the phone because it kind of made me tear up a little because when I say these men shaped and made me the women, the woman I am today, I am grateful that I was able to be a part of the King Charles Troop. So DJ, how about you? Do you remember uh, when you first heard about the King Charles Troop, these, these kids on bicycles? Did that mean yeah. unicycles? Because, you know, I'm from Chicago. Yeah. So, you know, they come to Chicago every two years. And there was one year when we became teenagers. And we were, I think it may be like 75, 1975. Um, a couple of older guys in my neighborhood went to um, to the show to sell concessions. And there was their first introduction to uh, these guys on the unicycle. And the first thing they did when the show was over, they came back to the neighborhood and told us, hey, you guys got to come down here, man, to, to, the, to the Ringling Brothers. You know, they got these guys on these unicycles. We're like, man, whatever. <laughs> and so we all <laughs> went down there, you know, to sell concessions. And, you know, when the, when, the, when the act came on, you know, it was just like, you know, <laughs> and ever since then, I've been attracted to it. Well, you know, I mean, that's that's part of it. When you saw these, I, mean, I love this. This is a classic picture of the early days of the King Charles yeah. Troop. But when you see the looks on their faces, you can just tell they're having a great time. Yeah. So so tell me a little bit about these guys. I know that, uh, you know, you talked for a minute there about Charles King himself. Uh, he must have been a leader, too, uh, to be able to pull all of these kids who were some of them even older than him into this troop. Uh, I think you're Kip. You're you're oh, muted. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, CK uh, was you know very inspirational uh, you know to us uh, as juniors. Uh, you know, just just seeing the representation in the center ring was you know moving enough for you know young kids such such as myself to just inspire uh, to be able to dream outside of our four wall. Uh, neighborhoods and only and and not to mention you know we also had the opportunity of coming out on the in su on the summers to work concession uh, during the day and then at night we would practice to hopefully be one one day in uh, introduced into uh, uh, the the center ring but 
we we had to really really practice and so so talk product. about that that apprenticeship i mean uh mr jerry king was still very much involved with recruiting new members of the troop right yeah uh correct like you know charlie you know would come uh you know to the bronx you know and you know recruit uh, I believe the first two recruits in Val, you might know this better than I do, uh, was Greg and Marky, I believe, were the first two recruits. So it was, hmm, it was, well, Jerome was already there. So, mm -hmm. and then there was, Harvey was there. I actually was there before Marky and oh, okay. Greg. They came after me. Okay. And wow, yeah. So, so these we were, are these are some of the kids, uh, Greg Roan and uh, Jerome. Um, you gotta tell me there. Oh, so yeah, Jerome, Jerome Owen. Uh, <laughs> and I think uh, actually, I think that I'm gonna see, and you can tell me. I think this is Jerome Owen. Uh, although I might I might have them mixed up because they were both kids at the time. But is that uh, Jerome or is that Greg? That is Roe. That's Jerome. Yep. And uh, obviously, you know, I, I can remember watching the show as a kid myself uh, and seeing, uh, it just seemed like they were having such a great time out there. And uh, I guess you were, right? Absolutely. For sure. Never worked a day. <laughs> I rode a unicycle, never worked a day. <laughs> so, so go ahead, Bill. I just, I want to interject because, because it's still Black History Month. The significance of this, you know, we're in a different time now. But in those times, it was, you know, 11 of us going down to Florida uh, to embark on this history making adventure with history not meaning much to us because we were just kids. So it was our job to have fun. However, I realized the importance and the impact that this would have. And uh, I set my mind as we rehearsed as we prepared for our opening in Florida, my mind was on opening the Madison Square Garden and what we were gonna look like coming home for people to see us. And uh, this is a time that, you know, se segregation had just passed. Uh, I had had an incident down there that was racially uh, motivated. These guys were so beautiful in how they worked together. Jerry King in, you know, we had gone to the White House. We had ridden from the Bronx in a relay to the White House to offer to go to entertain our troops in Vietnam. So we were all about positives. And I, I, it's very important that young people remember all the things, all the examples that have been set to look at where we are today and for them want to, part, to partake in, in doing more for this country. because. That's really the, the essential thing about the King Charles troop. They've not only had fun. I watched Kip and these guys. And by the way, I am the president of the Kip Jones <laughs> fan club because this guy has done so it's much good. to keep this dream alive. I yep. love him. I know Jerry would love him. I know Charlie would love him. He's done so, such a beautiful job of keeping the spirit that, when that we, we started. When we talk about uh, Charlie King in particular, uh, unfortunately, um, his life ended way too soon. Uh, yeah. Kip, you want to kind of uh, talk about the tragedy that uh, that left us without him? Yeah, so from what uh, I know uh, was uh, the team was performing at the California State Fair. Uh, I think it was maybe 91, 92. Um, and after the conclusion of uh, that engagement, uh, the team... Uh, then proceeded to make their way uh, back to Vegas uh, and transport, uh, being transported into two vehicles. Um, and then for whatever reason, one of those vehicles, uh, you know, steered off the road and started to uh, tumble. And um, I believe uh, it was, I think Charlie was thrown out of the vehicle, if I'm not mistaken, uh, as a result of that accident. And uh, there was another member, uh, Reese, um, that was also uh, uh, injured in that uh, accident uh, as well. But you, you know, the show, the show went on. I mean, it truly did because 
the legacy that uh, Charlie and Jerry King uh, had formed allowed you to continue with the show. And uh, and DJ, you were in Las Vegas uh, about that same time too, right? Uh, because the Felds were producing uh, Siegfried and Roy, and and you were a big part of that. Yeah, but at that particular time when that incident um, took place, um, we had finished our um, tour with them, and we were doing stuff out on our own. We were just going out and doing stuff, um, and that's why they were in um, California and coming back. But you know, there was um, also another person, Leslie. You know, we had um, three people uh, from the troop um, pass away from that accident. Yeah, a tr truly a tragedy. Uh... And, it, and it and it and it put a it put a hole in us. You know, it did. While we were we were we were here, everybody that was here, it it, it really put a hole in us, and it really got shaky at that particular point, and we weren't sure what we were gonna do. And um, a couple of the older guys, I say like. Um, like Floyd, uh, Sweet Harrison, um, he kind of rallied up and, and sucked it up and, you know, had a couple of meetings and everybody got together and we were able to um, put everything back together. And we started working at uh, one of the shows at um, downtown at the Lady Lock uh, with the First Lady of Magic, Melinda, the First Lady oh. of Magic. And um, that's, that's, that's what got us all started back up. Very interesting. So, uh, you know, obviously you guys uh, were a great act on your own, but Siegfried and Roy, I mean, that was the biggest act in Las Vegas. And you guys were uh, absolutely, uh, you know, a huge part of that performance, too. Tell us a little bit about uh, working in Vegas versus a circus there, DJ. <laughs> well, I, I have to I have to put the disclaimer. I, I didn't work the circus until like 97. I was fresh off the street of Chicago when they pulled me up and um, brought me to Las Vegas. And Charlie was in instrumental with that because he talked to my mom. I was about 20 years old and she didn't want me to go that far. But once we got here, um, it, it was one of the greatest things. But we also, you know, it's like you said, when even in 69, when you, when, when you had all these, you had a, a group of black men intertwining with internationals. So now you come to Las Vegas, this is 1981. So it was still kind of segregated a little bit. And now you got, you know, this group of black guys coming in and making waves in on the strip, you know, we, we, during times that, let's just say during, during times where black people weren't really were just being allowed to work on the strip sure. during that particular time. So now you have us coming in, and now we are part of this. And you know, it, it was it was a big dynamic. <laughs> but I'm sure I it was. It. I loved it. <laughs> well, you're still you're still there, right? Yes. <laughs> Not <laughs> and, working and, on the strip, but I'm still here. And you mentioned, uh, you know, Sweet Harrison, who obviously, uh, you know, he was one of the originals. He's still mm -hmm. there in Las Vegas also. Um, what what a great uh, group of guys who have been a part of this. And again, you know, because of Charlie King. You know, we, you are watching uh, Circus History Live. This is our monthly uh, get together where we talk about issues not only related to current circus history, but also those things that have happened in the past. And what a wonderful opportunity during Black History Month to get together and talk about the King Charles Troop and their impact on the American circus. Uh, this is really a monthly opportunity for us, you to learn a little bit about the Circus Historical Society, but we would also encourage your membership. And if you'd like to learn more, you can go to circushistory.org and we hope you'll also enjoy us next month. So we are now speaking uh, about the King Charles Troop. We've got Kip Jones on the line, Bill Minson, Valerie Mungo, and uh, DJ Daryl Johnson. What uh, we'd also like to do is maybe get some of your calls or questions really uh, for these guys. Some of you, I think, have worked with them in the past. Uh, if you have any uh, questions or comments, love for you to put them up in the chat right now. Um, I know David Carlion, who was with the Ringling Blue Show, worked with the troop in 77 and 78, uh, said that he lived with you on the train car. Uh, the only uh, clown who was able to 
pick up some uh, basketball games with the guys between shows every evening. And I, I know Dave Carlion and he's a tall guy. So uh, he probably was pretty, pretty good uh, playing on whichever squad he was playing on. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when you guys were also uh, a part and, and Donna Paul talks about the fact, you know, working as a showgirl uh, on the show, you guys were, because there was such a large troupe, you were also used a lot in the specs and things like that. Uh, DJ, when you came back on the show, tell us a little bit about how you appeared in other acts other than just the basketball. Um, in 97, because even in, even in Sick Fin Roy here in, in, in Las Vegas, we also did um, other numbers other than um, just the routine. Um, and in 97, when I did that, uh, we also did... Um, like spec and all that. Um, it's different, but also it was fun. You know, it's so many of us and it, it was just, it just made sense. <laughs> well, you had an opportunity too, to, uh, you know, kind of show off your uh, dancing skills a little bit, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to call it that. <laughs> yeah, Val did some interesting things in production. Well, yeah. Val, Val, you not only uh, participated in in the basketball act. Really, I think you were, if not the first, one of the first uh, women to be a part of the King Charles troupe, also, right? But you also rode elephants and other things. <laughs> I did, um, which was quite interesting. Um, <laughs> oddly enough, joining the circus to play basketball, to be center ring, to be the first. Um, woman of color to be a part of, uh, to be the first woman to be a part of the King Charles troop was amazing. Um, but I was then introduced to riding elephants, which was <laughs> quite an experience. Um, and, and this I, was I, on the I, blue I, unit, right? This is on the blue unit. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, fascinating experience. Um, it, 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 it makes me smile when I think about, um, the different dynamics that I was allowed to be a part of with Ringling Brothers and the King. Hey, Val, hey Val, did you tell your kids about riding the elephant? Of course, I, I have <laughs> photos, and um, I still actually I still ride. Um, I still have a unicycle. Yeah, me so too. Yeah, so that you know, kind of keeps me in shape. Um, yeah, so it's 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 been a amazing it's been amazing pretty good exercise huh so absolutely so, so tell sure. me a little bit val about uh you know learning to ride that unicycle i mean who taught you how to do it so i actually i started riding when i was about 12 years old um there was a a woman um by the name of patricia we called her pepper she had um started a girl's troop and i was very much interested in being a part of that um, it's just, which is where I learned and mastered the art of unicycling. And then one summer, um, Charlie invited me to come and travel with the troop uh, for the summer, for a summer experience. Um, and during that time, I met uh, Kenneth and Irvin Feld, and they were interested in incorporating me into the act. Hence, I became a part of the King Charles troop. That's great. So when when you guys look back on uh, you know those years, you after you left Ringling, you you talked a little bit DJ about some of the other things that you were uh, involved with, including uh, Universal, uh, even the Hannaford Circus in recent years, and now Kip, you're involved with uh, Omnium Circus, Lisa Lewis's uh, circus. I think you actually had performances this weekend in uh, suburban Washington D.C. Tell us a little bit about the troupe today. Uh, well, the troop today uh, consists of some of uh, the members from our second generation and some of the third and fourth uh, generation members now. Uh, like I had early, uh, mentioned earlier, we are, are, we're even trying to reach out uh, to uh, female riders to get them inspired. And I'm hoping to uh, reach out to Val for some help on that. Uh, Absolutely. On the road. Uh, Absolutely. And, just, and just, you know, we incorporate you know, those those teachings and disciplines that, you know, were handed down to us uh, because it's all about passing it on, right? We want to try to, you know, show the, the youth today 
on you know what things lie outside of um, barriers that they might come up against when they might you know feel frustrated or can't talk to someone you know there's there's things out there and people out there that you know you can reach out to and through the unicycle you know we were able to uh, you know guide our direction and 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 hone in on a um, uh, a skill that you know some of us never knew we had. And, and really building character, I'm sorry, and just not to downplay, building character was <laughs> paramount in being a part of the King Charles Church. <clears throat> right, which it was, was always, a, it was always yeah, about, you know, when you step that... out the ring. Oh, sorry, Val, go ahead. No, go ahead, that's fine. No, I was just going to say another thing that uh, the troop always told, told us about is watch your conduct uh, in the ring <laughs> just as well as outside the ring. Well, I think that's uh, really kind of Jerry Jerry King's vision, right? To uh, to kind of give back. Indeed, indeed, it was all about you know help, helping your your fellow man, helping to pull their coattails, uh, and just you know let them know about pitfalls that he or she may you know encounter in life as uh, as young people. So. Um... Bill, when you look back, uh, I mean, does 55 years ago, I mean, that's a lot of water under the bridge, but uh, you were there at the very beginning, even before the beginning. Uh, did you ever think that this would be what it is today? You know, it's, it's interesting, Chris. Next year is my 60th year in entertainment. And uh, I've been in various parts of entertainment, but this is where it started. And uh, it would be impossible to imagine that these group of kids that I looked at on a basketball court in Cretona Park would wind up playing for more than a hundred million people around the world. There's, it's, there's no way I can even calculate anything like that. I've, I feel extremely blessed to be there at the beginning, to watch it continue. And as I said, to sit with Kenneth and his family the other night as Ringling open again in New York, it's 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 surreal. It really is. Well, it's uh, it's really been uh, an interesting uh, journey, that's for sure. A couple of years ago, um, a couple of years ago, things happened that were really significant as it relates to the troupe and also circus history. First of all, uh, you were uh, inducted into the Circus Hall of uh, Circus Ring of Fame in Sarasota. Circus Ring of Fame, which is located in St. Armand Circle. Every uh, year they get together and uh, induct a, a group. Several of you were down there. You performed down there uh, before they uh, presented you with the plaque. Uh, what was that like to be recognized uh, along with you know, some of the, the greats, John Ringling and Lillian Leitzel and people like that? I, I mean, you know, just to be recognized by your peers in general is always, you know, an honor, um, you know, in, in the circus industry. And, you know, it's, it's just a testament to what Mr. King and Mrs. King did for uh, the group on taking a group of uh, young, uh, untrained um, youth from uh, the city streets and get them into uh, the city uh, into the center ring of the greatest show uh, on earth. Yeah, it's really, uh, really a tribute. And then not long after that, uh, up there in the South Bronx, there was uh, another important thing happened uh, when the community actually recognized what what uh, Jerry mm -hmm. King and each of you gave gave to the city and gave to that neighborhood. Tell me a little bit about what happened that day. Oh, so yeah, that day uh, we were honored by uh, New York City uh, by uh, being having one of the streets named, uh, co-named the King Charles uh, Unicycle uh, Troop Way, which is right down the street from the Katona Park where it all happened and adjacent from the apartment building where Mr. King taught Charles in his hallway how to ride a unicycle and bringing them out that following summer where all the kids uh, saw Charlie doing all these fascinating, uh, unlike human things on a unicycle. So if you get up to Clinton and 170th uh, in the South Bronx, you'll see there's a big sign there that says King Charles 
bicycle or King Charles Troop Way, I think is what it actually says. Yeah, Unicycle Troop Way. Uh-huh. Yeah, Unicycle Troop Way. Uh, and that's a lasting memory. But wow, you know, when I take a look at uh, what you guys are doing today and how you said we're in the fifth generation of King Charles Troop, uh, it sounds like uh, you're still growing them. And uh, it is it is definitely uh, something that will continue for many, many years to come. Yeah, you know, with the grace of God and, you know, the spirit of Charlie and Mr. King and those who have, have gone uh, before us, you know, we, we hope to, you know, be able to affect uh, another group of kids that can hopefully take this legacy uh, to the next level. So, DJ, uh, you obviously uh, have had uh, a different kind of experience with the show performing in Las Vegas, as well as the circus ring. Uh, tell me a little bit, you know, we talked about that a little earlier the difference between being on stage and uh, you know being in a in an environment where you've got maybe ten thousand people watching you. Well, um, being on stage is it's like stability, you know. It's, it's 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 and and the audience is a little bit closer, so it's more intimate. That's what I get from it. Like just yeah. it's just the intimacy of the of the crowd. I mean, you don't have them all around you, and it's not as many, but they are right there, and you can see and you can really see faces, and you can really you know see that they're enjoying what you're doing, which makes you enjoy what you're doing more. So you're playing really to individuals rather than uh, this mass. It sounds like. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple. You know, you you find a couple of people that that's that's actually paying attention and you and you look at them and you know you smile and you keep doing what you're doing and just make sure that they're having a good time and i know that they do they always have when they watch the king charles troop so yeah. you've been uh you've been watching another episode of circus history live uh, we've been focusing on the history and legacy of the king charles troop uh, which is celebrating this year the 55th anniversary of its first appearance with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey, but as uh, we learned a little while ago, the the uh, the history goes back much further than that. I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, today, and I hope that uh, you will continue to come back for more episodes of Circus History Live. And if you have any interest in uh, learning more about the Circus Historical Society, our quarterly magazine, The Bandwagon, uh, and also Circus History Live, uh, I urge you to go to our website, circushistory.org. Thanks again for joining us, uh, Kim Anthony Jones, Bill Minson, uh, Valerie Mungo, and Daryl Johnson, uh, and uh, we'll see you down the road. Bruce? Hi, Chris. Thank you, everybody. What an awesome way to celebrate Black History Month. Thank you so much, guys, for coming on. This is, and, and Valerie, this is wonderful, wonderful. I'd like to thank uh, Kip, Valerie, Daryl, and Reverend Bill Minson, and of the King Charles Troop and our host, uh, Chris Berry doing another terrific job. And behind the scenes, uh, Mike Iozo, who's doing the recording for tonight's program on Unoris, also works on our marketing and our YouTube channel. They are part of this as well. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning, tuning in to Circus History Live. As Chris said, the Circus Historical Society is a, a terrific group. We do a lot of cool things. We have a convention coming up in Atlanta. Those of you who are interested in coming down to Atlanta, we're gonna have a wonderful convention. Um, we're going to have the um, Circus Vazquez as our host circus. It'll be a, a very nice program. And uh, we're looking for proposals for, for presentations. If you go to our website, circushistory.org, you'll find a place there where you can do that. And as Chris said, if you'd like to join us, uh, we'd love to have you. We have a wonderful journal that we put out uh, quarterly, and it's a you know, professional uh, journal magazine. This one's 100 pages, actually. Um, we'd love to have you come, come on board. So thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure. Kip, Reverend Bill, Valerie, DJ. Awesome. Awesome. My pleasure. Thank you for thank having you. me. Um, and you know what, Chris, actually, before we uh, close out, uh, there was one individual we forgot to mention. I know there's a lot of other individuals, but one person that actually helped cement the, uh, the legacy is Albert Cuts Owens. Mm, absolutely. He was the one that picked up the basketball on the basketball court that day and shot it into the hoop. Yeah, and we that, didn't tell that story. Uh, can you just yeah. quickly tell that story? It's a great, great little uh, way to end this. Yeah. How so, it all started. 
Yeah, so, you know, one day the guys are practicing in, in Katona Park. You know, they're they're doing their other, you know, uh, sports uh, uh, activities with the unicycle. And they just happen to be practicing a couple of, maybe a, a hundred feet away from the basketball court. And some other guys, you know, playing on feet were, you know, playing, you know, regular street ball. And the ball just happened to bounce over in the direction of the troop where they were practicing, uh, practicing at in Katona Park. So who picks up the basketball? Albert cuts Owens. He takes it, shoots it on his unicycle, shoots it all, all, all basket, and that's what started the whole idea of unicycle basketball. And it, and uh, it continues on decades later. Thanks again, folks, and we'll see you on the next episode of Circus History Live. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody.